Paddington at Large by Michael Bond Chapter 3 Goings on at number 32 Paddington walked with a start and then sat up in bed, rubbing his eyes. For a moment or two he wasn't quite sure where he was, but gradually as a number of familiar objects swam into view, he realised with surprise it was in his own room. The afternoon sun was streaming in through the window and after blinking several times he lay back again with his paws behind his head and a thoughtful expression on his face. Although he wasn't quite sure what had disturbed him, he felt very glad he'd woken when he did for he'd been in the middle of a particularly nasty dream about a large jar of special marmalade from the cut price grocer in the market. In the dream, something had gone wrong with the lid and no matter how much he tried, nothing would budge it. Mrs Bird's best tin opener had broken off at the handle and when he tried squeezing it in a door jam, the door had fallen off. Even Mr Brown's hammer and cord chisel had made no impression at all and after several bangs, the head had flown off the hammer and broken the dining room window. In fact, if he hadn't woken at that moment, there was no knowing what other awful things might have happened. Paddington heaved a sigh of relief and, after dipping a paw into an open jar of marmalade by his bed, in order to make sure everything really was all right, he closed his eyes again. The Brown household was unusually quiet and peaceful that afternoon, for Paddington had the house to himself. In the morning, the postman had brought Jonathan and Judy a surprise invitation to a tea party, and by the same delivery a letter had arrived asking Mrs Brown and Mrs Bird to visit an old aunt who lived on the other side of London. Even Paddington should have been out, for Mr Brown had given him several books to take back to the public library, together with a long list of things he wanted looking up in the reference department. It was Mr Brown's list which had proved to be Paddington's undoing, for he had taken it upstairs to his room after lunch in order to study it, and before he knew where he was he had nodded off. Thinking the matter over, Paddington wasn't quite sure whether it was the result of an extra-large lunch, with two helpings of suet pudding, or the hot afternoon sun, or even a mixture of both. But whatever the reason, he must have been asleep for over an hour, for in the distance he could hear a clock striking three. It was as the last of the chimes died away that Paddington suddenly sat bolt upright in his bed and stared with wide open eyes at the ceiling. Unless he was dreaming again, there was a strange scraping noise coming from somewhere directly overhead. It began by the door, then passed across the room in the direction of the window and paused for a moment before coming all the way back again. Paddington's eyes got larger and larger as he listened to the sound and they nearly popped out altogether a few moments later when a noise remarkably like that of a hammer and chisel broke the silence which followed the scraping. After pinching himself several times to make sure it had nothing to do with his dream, Paddington jumped out of bed and hurried across the room in order to investigate the matter. As he flung open the window, an even stranger thing happened, and when he jumped back into the room as if he had been shot, for just as he peered outside, a long, black, snake-like object came into view and hung there, twisting and turning for several seconds before it finally disappeared from view below the ledge. Paddington backed across the room and, after making a grab for his hat and suitcase, rushed out on the landing, banging the door behind him. Although after the dream and the strange events that had followed he was prepared for almost anything, Paddington certainly wasn't expecting a sight which met his eyes on the landing and he almost wished he'd stayed in his room. Only a few yards away, between his door and the top of the stairs, there was a ladder which definitely hadn't been there after lunch. It was leaning against the trapdoor in the ceiling, and worse still, the trapdoor itself was wide open. Paddington was a brave bear at heart, but even so, it took him several moments to pluck up his courage again. After pulling his hat well down over his head, and carefully placing his suitcase at the top of the stairs in case of an emergency, he began climbing slowly up the ladder. It was when he reached the top rung and peered over the edge into the loft that Paddington's worst suspicions were realised, for there, tiptoeing across the rafters with a torch in one hand and what looked like a long knife in the other, was a man in a trilby hat and blue overalls. Holding his breath, Paddington considered the matter for several seconds before coming to a decision. As quietly as possible, he stretched his paw into the darkness until he felt the edge of the trap door. 
and then he flung it back into place and pushed the boat home as hard as he could before scrambling down the ladder onto the landing in safety. All at once, there was a commotion on the roof as someone started to shout, then several bumps, followed by the sound of banging on the other side of the trap door. But by that time, Paddington was much too far away to hear what was going on. The sound of the Browns' front door slamming had added itself to the general hubbub, and he was halfway down Windsor Gardens, hurrying along the pavement with a very determined expression on his face indeed. All in all, he decided that bad though his dream had been, things had been worse since he'd woken up, and it was definitely time to call for help. After rounding several corners, Paddington at last reached the place he'd been looking for. It was a large, old-fashioned stone building, which stood slightly apart from the rest on a corner site. Most of the windows had bars across them, and at the top of some steps leading up to the entrance, there was a blue lamp with the words POLICE written across it in white letters. Paddington hurried up the steps and then paused at the entrance. Leading from the hall, there were a number of doors, and it was difficult to decide which was the best one. In the end, he picked on a large brown door on his right. It looked more important than any of the others, and Paddington was a firm believer in going to the top whenever he had an emergency. After knocking several times, he waited with his ear against the keyhole until he heard a gruff voice call out, Come in, and then pushed the door open with his paw. The only person in the room was a man sitting behind a desk near the window, and he looked rather cross when he saw Paddington. You've come to the wrong place, he said. Undesirables are supposed to report around the beck. Undesirables? exclaimed Paddington hotly, giving the man a hard stare. I'm not an undesirable, I'm a bear. The man jumped up from behind his desk. I beg your pardon, he said. The light's none too good, and I thought for a moment you were hairy, hairy. Hurry, hurry, repeated Paddington, hardly able to believe his ears. He's what we call the Portobello Prowler, the man added confidentially, and he's been giving us a lot of trouble lately. He's only small, and he slips in through petty windows when no one's looking. His voice trailed away as Paddington's stare got harder and harder. Uh, what can we do for you, he said. I'd like to see Sid, please, said Paddington, putting down his suitcase. Sid, repeated the man, looking more surprised. I don't think we have any Sids here. We've several elves and a bird, but I don't recall any Sids of hand. It says on the notice outside, you've got one, said Paddington firmly. It's written on a door. The man looked puzzled for a moment, and then his face cleared. You don't mean Sid, you mean C-I-D. That's quite a different matter, he explained. C-I-D stands for Criminal Investigation Department. Oh, there's a criminal in Mr. Brown's roof, said Paddington, not to be outdone, and I think he needs investigating. A criminal in Mr. Brown's roof, repeated the man, taking a notepad and pencil as he listened while Paddington went on to explain all that had taken place. Good work, Bear, he exclaimed when Paddington had finished talking. We don't often catch anyone red-handed. I'll send out an alert at once. With that, he pressed a button on the side of his desk, and in a matter of seconds, the police station became a hive of activity. In fact, Paddington hardly had time to adjust his hat and pick up his suitcase before he found himself being led by several policemen into a yard at the back of the building, where he was bundled into the back seat of a large black car. Paddington felt most important as the car shot down the road in the direction of Windsor Gardens. He had never been inside a police car before, and it was all very interesting. He didn't remember having travelled quite as fast either, and he was most impressed when a policeman on point duty held up all of the other traffic and waved them across some lights which were at red. Rate bear, said the CID man as the car screeched to a halt outside Mr Brown's house. Lead the way, only watch out. If he's got a knife, he may be dangerous. Paddington thought for a moment and then raised his hat. After you, he said politely, taking things all round, Paddington felt as he'd had his fair share of adventures for that day, and apart from that, he was anxious to make sure his store of marmalade was safe before anything else happened. Do you mean to say, exclaimed the policeman as he looked down at the man in the blue overalls, you are putting up a television aerial all the time? That's right, officer, said the man, and I've got a letter from Mr Brown to prove it. Gave me a key of the ass, he did. Said there would be no one else here as he was getting rid of them for the day. And I set myself in on account of it being a special surprise for the rest of the family. Didn't want him to know about it. The man in the overalls paused for breath and then handed a card to the policeman. Higgins is the name. Tip-top tillies. If you ever want a job done, just give me a ring. Tip, 
Tip Tillies, repeated the CID man, looking distastefully at the cord. He turned to Paddington. I thought you said he had a knife, bear. It wasn't a knife, said Mr Higgins. It was my tweaker. Your tweaker? exclaimed Paddington, looking most upset. That's right, said Mr Higgins cheerfully as he held up a long screwdriver. Always carry one of these on account of having to give the old tellies a tweak when they want adjusting. I tell you what, he added as he waved his hand in the direction of a large cabinet which stood in one corner of the dining room. I'm nearly ready to switch on. Just got to connect the aerial. With this young bear's permission, I vote we take five minutes off, brew up a cup of tea. It's nothing like a nice cup of tea for cooling things down. Mr Higgins gave Paddington a broad wink. If there's a detective play on, we might even pick up a few hints here. As a spluttering noise came from one of the policemen, Paddington disappeared hurriedly in the direction of the kitchen. The CID man's fear seemed to have gone a rather nasty shade of red, and he didn't like the look of it at all. All the same, when he returned a few minutes later, staggering under the weight of a tray full of cups and saucers and a large plate of buns, even the policeman began to look more cheerful, and in no time at all, the dining room began to echo with the sound of laughter as everyone recounted their part in the afternoon's adventure. In between explaining all about the various knobs on the television and making some last-minute adjustments, Mr Higgins kept them all amused with tales of other adventures he'd had in the trade. In fact, the time passed so quickly, everyone seemed sorry when at last it was time to leave. Oh, I've just sold two more television sets, whispered Mr Higgins, nodding towards the policeman as he paused at the door. So if I can ever do you a favour, just let me know. One good turn deserves another. Thank you very much, Mr Higgins, said Paddington gratefully. Having waved goodbye to everyone, Paddington shut the front door and hurried back into the dining room. Although he was pleased at the mystery of the bumps in the roof being solved, he was anxious to test Mr Brown's new television set before the others arrived home, and he quickly drew the curtains before settling himself comfortably in one of the armchairs. In the past, he'd often watched television in a shop window in the Portobello Road, but the manager had several times come out to complain about his breathing heavily on the windows during the cowboy films, and Paddington was sure it'd be much nicer to be able to sit at home and watch in comfort. But when he had seen a cartoon, some cricket, two musical items, and a programme on bird watching, Paddington's interest began to flag, and after helping himself to another bun, he turned his attention to a small booklet which Mr Higgins had left behind. The book was called How to Get the Best Out of Your Television, and it was full of pictures and diagrams, rather like maps of the underground, showing the inside of the set. There was even a chapter showing how to adjust the various knobs in order to get the best pictures, and Paddington spent some time sitting in front of the set, turning the brightness up and down, and making unusual patterns on the screen. There were so many different knobs to turn, and so many different things it was possible to do with the picture, that he soon lost all account of the time, and he was more surprised when the dining room clock suddenly struck six. It was while he was hurriedly turning all the knobs back to where they'd been to start with, that something very unexpected and alarming happened. One moment a cowboy on a white horse was dashing across the screen in hot pursuit of a man with a black moustache and side whiskers. The next moment there was a click, and before Paddington's astonished gears, the picture shrank in size until there was nothing left but a small white dot. He spent some moments peering hopefully at the screen through his opera glasses, but the longer he looked, the smaller the dot became, and even striking a match didn't help matters, for by the time he had been in the kitchen to fetch the box, the spot had disappeared completely. Paddington stood in front of the silent receiver with a mournful expression on his face. Although Mr Brown had gone to a lot of trouble in order to surprise the family, it was quite certain he wouldn't be at all pleased if they received that much of a surprise and arrived home to find it wasn't even working. Paddington heaved a deep sigh. Oh dear, he said as he addressed the world in general. I'm in trouble again. I can't understand it, said Mr Brown as he came out of the dining room. Mr Higgins promised faithfully it would be all ready by the time we got home. Never mind, Henry, said Mrs Brown, as the rest of the family crowded round the doorway. He was a surprise, and I'm sure he'll be able to get it working soon. Crikey! exclaimed Jonathan. He must have been having a lot of trouble. Look at all the pieces. Don't bother to draw the curtains. We'll eat in the kitchen, said Mrs Brown, as she took in the scene. There were bits and pieces everywhere, not to mention a large number of valves and a cathode ray tube on the settee. Mrs. Bird looked puzzled. He thought you said it wasn't working, she remarked. I don't see how it could be, replied Mr. Brown.
Well, there's something there, said Mrs. Bird, pointing to the screen. A sight move. The Brown family peered through the gloom at the television set. Although it didn't seem possible Mrs. Bird could be right, now they looked there was definitely some kind of movement in the glass. It looks rather furry, said Mrs. Brown. Perhaps it's one of those animal programmes. They do have a lot on television. Jonathan was nearest to the screen, and he suddenly clutched Judy's arm. Crumbs, he whispered as his eyes grew accustomed to the dark, and he caught sight of a familiar-looking nose pressed against the glass. It isn't a programme, it's Paddington. He must be stuck inside the cabinet. This is most interesting, said Mr. Brown, taking out his glasses. Switch on the light, someone. I'd like a closer look. As a muffled exclamation came from somewhere inside the television, Jonathan and Judy hurriedly placed themselves between Mr. Brown and the screen. Don't you think you ought to ring Mr. Higgins, Dad? asked Judy. He'll know what to do. We'll go down and fetch him if you like, said Jonathan. It won't take a minute. Yes, come along, Henry, said Mrs. Brown. I should leave things just as they are. There's no knowing what might happen if you touch them. Rather reluctantly, Mr. Brown allowed himself to be shepherded out of the room, closely followed by Jonathan and Judy. Mrs. Bird was the last one to leave, and before she closed the door, she took one last look around the room. There are some rather nasty marmalade stains on that cabinet, she said in a loud voice. If I were a young bear, I'd make sure they're wiped off by the time Mr. Higgins gets here. Otherwise, certain people may put two and two together. Although Mrs. Bird kept a firm hand on goings-on in the Brown household, she was a great believer in a proverb, least said, soonest mended, especially when it had to do with anything as complicated as the television set. If Mr. Higgins was surprised at having to repay Paddington's good turn so soon, he didn't show it by so much as the flicker of an eyelid. All the same, after Mrs. Bird had spoken to him, he took Paddington on one side, and they had a long chat together while he explained how dangerous it was to take the back of a television receiver if you didn't know what you were doing. "'It's a good job Bear's paws are well insulated, Mr. Brown,' he said as he bade goodbye to Paddington. "'Otherwise you might not be here to tell the tale.' That's all right, he added cheerfully as Paddington thanked him for all his trouble. Got a bit of marmalade on my tweak up, but otherwise there's no harm done, and I dare say it'll wash off. It usually does, said Mrs. Bird with the voice of experience as she showed him to the door. As the Browns trooped into the dining room for their first evening's viewing, it was noticeable that one member of the family settled himself as far away from the screen as possible. Although Mr. Higgins had screwed the back on the television as tightly as his tweak would allow, Paddington wasn't taking any more chances than he could help. Mind you, said Mr. Brown later in the evening when Mrs. Bird came in with the bedtime snack, I still can't understand what it was we saw on the screen. It was very strange. It was probably some kind of interference, said Mrs. Bird gravely. I don't suppose it'll happen again, do you, Paddington? As she spoke, several pairs of eyes turned in Paddington's direction, but most of his face was carefully hidden behind a large mug, and very wisely he only nodded his agreement. Not that he was having to pretend he felt tired, for in fact it was only the cork or steam that was keeping his eyelids open at all. Nevertheless, there was something about the way his whiskers were porking out on either side of the mug that suggested Mrs. Bird had hit the nail on the head, and that as far as the Brown family were concerned... There was one kind of interference they weren't likely to get on their television again in a hurry.